However, I usually do an icebreaker. I'm James Hargrove. And do we have anyone here from Minnesota? Have you been there? All right. So you, you would know at any rate. So there's a category of humor called the Norwegian joke that always stars Ole, Sven, and Lena. So one day, Ole walks into a bar and he sees his friend Sven. And Sven says, say, Ole, I hear you got another kid. What's this about you and Lena? Isn't that nine? What's happening? And Ole says, air conditioning. <laughs> I don't have to finish it. You get, you get the point. <laughs> yeah, Lena used to take the summer off. <laughs> Forget. <laughs> well, so long about last December, Katie told me that she had written permission from the uh, family of Vivian Sherlock to republish the Fever Man. And like, well, myself, I said, that would be easy to digitize using a little desktop scanner, and it really was. It took about an hour, but going from a desktop scanner to OCR to Adobe Acrobat to 47 different Pro Minion fonts that are different on every page, <laughs> it's April, let's put it that way. So, so. So anyway, that got me involved, but one of the first things we needed was to go to the museum and meet Peggy. It was Peggy's first day, I believe. It was, and we got permission, because I had seen, there's a, a glass window pane that has items and artifacts related to Dr. Gorey. And behind that window pane, there's a little antique frame with a portrait in it. And I got permission from Joshua Hudson to to have Peggy and Jeremy Roundtree open that window, which I had to take it off with a screwdriver, take the thing out of the frame and get a picture. And it turned out the frame is a daguerreotype, and I will show you that. Um, I guess I'm kind of going roundabout into the, the stuff I was already going to talk about. And one of these things is a right arrow, so I'm just going to go ahead with that. And uh, I'm pointing out two people here. This is Vivian Sherlock. Uh, who is the author of a book published in 1982. It's a very fascinating historical account of what life was like in territorial Apalachicola. It's just a wonderful, lively account. Uh, she's a very excellent writer. But everyone who writes anything about Dr. Gorey has to go back to a gentleman named Captain Charles Henry Whiteside, who among many things in his life, was one of the founders of the Apalachicola Ice Company. And as a founder of the Apalachicola Ice Company, he knew since his family had moved to Apalachicola before Dr. Gorey died, and his, his brother and, and mother and father certainly knew Dr. Gorey, so he knew what Dr. Gorey had done. Everyone had forgotten by the 1880s. And he said, I'm going to write a bio biography of Dr. Gorey. And he talked to Dr. Alvin Wentworth Chapman, who was a friend of Dr. Gorey's, to get written descriptions and uh, timelines for what had happened. And he spoke to the only surviving member of Dr. Gorey's family, who was Sarah Gorey Robinson Floyd, um, uh, uh, basically uh, his, his daughter, who was still alive until about 1907. And he, he wrote a uh, Captain Whiteside wrote a beautiful autobiography. What is, oh, that's Katie's head. Excuse <laughs> me. I saw a glow to my left. <laughs> uh, at, at any rate, the, uh, the biography is a beautiful rendition of Dr. Gorey, description of everything he did and his patent, but there was no photograph of Dr. Gorey. So that's sort of my lead into we had to get the photographs for new images for this book, because if you scan a book that was published in 1982, uh, it's, the, the, the photographs are just not particularly clear. And that's why I went to the museum with my camera, and that's why we took the, uh, the uh, image apart. Of the, and as part of doing this work, one of the things I wanted to find out was exactly where was it in Apalachicola that Dr. Gorey lived. So I thought I would show you. I hope this is a little visible. We are up here roughly about the H. And the Gorey home was about four blocks back towards the bridge. Um, 
across the street from the mansion house. And we all know where this is because it is adjacent to the Coombs, Fort Coombs Armory. It's sort of a parking lot with the flag in it of the Fort Coombs Armory. And there is no marker. There's no marker that says Dr. Gorey figured out how to make ice in Florida on this site in 1840 something or other. Uh, the Gorey Museum, of course, is here. The mansion house was directly across the street and Dr. Gorey basically was an, an investor in the mansion house with several other people. And he, he basically worked as postmaster at the customs house, which was a federal facility, and also at what the locals called the Marine Hospital. It was never formally a Marine Hospital, but Dr. Gorey was paid by the Marine Hospital service, and he was the quarantine officer in port uh, during the 1830s and 40s. So if a ship came in with fever, he was the one who had to go examine the crew and the captain and see what was amiss. And, well, that's, I guess on my screen I'm getting the preview of the next thing. So I took my camera after having visited Peggy and went to Fort Coombs Armory. And this vacant lot here is basically where the Gorey home used to be. It survived the Civil War and it was there until about 1897 and finally was pulled down. And I'm showing the Chapman House next to it because the record suggests that the Chapman House and the Gorey House which was the former Florida Hotel, were almost identical. They were built in the same period, possibly even by the same people. So the Florida Hotel where he came in as a boarder and stayed on as a husband uh, were, were very similar uh, structures. And i say a word about Dr. Gorey's family. This is something I hadn't known, but there is a composite photograph that was taken probably during the 1860s, of prominent young men of Apalachicola. This is Dr. Gorey's son. His name was John Myrick Gorey. Uh, Myrick was Carolyn's maiden name. Uh, his wife, Carolyn uh, Myrick Beeman Gorey, <laughs> basically. But uh, Dr. Gorey's son served in the Civil War and was wounded. He came back to Apalachicola and died, presumably a consequence of the wounds, in 1866. And a result of that, only his sister Sarah was the only surviving member of the family uh, directly related to them. So Sarah Gorey married uh, Captain Floyd. He was killed in the Civil War and then she uh, remarried a fellow named Robinson. So she became Sarah Gorey Floyd Robinson. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, this is the only portrait that I know of of anybody in the family, except that one painted portrait that we think is Dr. Gorey uh, that was is present in the museum and basically there was a sequence of events first uh, Captain Whiteside wrote the biography and it was published in Ice and Refrigeration in 1897 and said so, uh, an achievement this great of making ice in Florida first patent in the United States deserves to be memorialized in the town and so he arranged with the members of the uh, the Southern Ice Exchange to raise money to place a monument which is basically what is in what we now call Gorey Square. And there was no likeness of him because on speaking to Sarah Gorey Robinson uh, Floyd, or vice versa, she said there is no portrait. And so he had none. But because of the, the uh, work that he had done, uh, Captain Whiteside was put on the commission uh, intended to uh, commission a statue of Dr. Gorey that would be placed in Washington, D.C. in Statuary Hall. And somewhere in his investigation for that, he apparently found a uh, portrait. It said this, the Ocala Banner in 1911 had this little blurb, the statue of Dr. Gorey was made possible by the securing of Captain George H. Whiteside of the only known existing portrait of the distinguished Floridian who was born in 1803 and died 1855, more than half a century ago. And Basically, one of the events that happened was after he died, of course, 1860-61, the Civil War started, Carolyn uh, Gorey and her family moved up to f other family lands or up in Jackson County. So they moved away from Apalachicola and they never came back. I don't really know the whole sequence of the house. The house was sold to other people and eventually was deemed unlivable. Uh, so basically she said, almost all of his artifacts, his medical library, his writings, 
patent applications and all sorts of things seem to have been lost in that transfer. Something about the, the, the havoc of the Civil War and basically either she did not take it up to Jackson County with her or it was lost or something happened. Um, uh, so basically we don't have much of, a, of knowledge of some of the things he did. And I wanted to show you the actual portrait. This is Ranger Jeremy Roundtree. Does he still operate the Orman House? He's not, that's, that's, that's gone on. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, I suspected as much at any rate. So, but this is Jeremy, the day we got permission for him to open a, a little vault in there and get the portrait out. And, and I'll show you a close up of this, but here you, you can see he has taken out a cotton cloth and he's holding it very carefully. It's a, an old item. And there's a close up of the portrait. I hope it shows a little. What you can see is there's a copper frame around it. And this is the kind of frame that was used for daguerreotypes. And the newspapers of the time said, that a daguerreotype had been sent to the sculptor to do the sculpture. Well, this is that kind of frame because this copper uh, frame around the outside is basically a clamp that would have held a piece of glass that would have had the actual daguerreotype on it to another piece of glass that was backing it. And the two together would have been clamped into this frame. But looking at this immediately, we knew that is not a daguerreotype. And Jeremy <laughs> got out his pocket knife and he pried open the frame and we opened the back and I couldn't see anything on it, but Peggy said, the back of that paper says Kodak, Velox. So I looked up V-E-L-O-X on the internet and it said a kind of photographic paper acquired by Kodak in 1899. So I said, well, how about that? So we know Captain Whiteside was looking for a portrait. The thing to me that is interesting is this is a photo of a painting. I have no record, no knowledge of who had the painting. Where did Captain Whiteside get it? Possibly only people in his family may know. That would be one of the coups. It's one of the three big mysteries. Could we find out who actually had that portrait and can, can we verify it's Dr. Gorey? I think we can. And actually, if you look right here, there are drapes. I'm going to go to the next photo. Where it's, showing a little larger, and to my eyes it looks pretty clear. Oh, excuse me, I'm on this side. This drape comes down from behind Dr. Gorey and blows in front of his shoulder, not behind it. In other words, he's by a window with a breeze blowing through the window, blowing the drape in front of his uh, cocked elbow, and it comes back over here, but every artist who ever copied it puts the drapes behind Dr. Gorey. And I think that's significant because one of the reasons of hanging drapes in an antebellum home when there was yellow fever was to keep the swamp gas out. He came so close to knowing it was mosquitoes. He actually commented on, by gosh, when we get this ventilation and air conditioning done, or room cooling, it will be so cool in there that even the mosquitoes won't like it. <laughs> but he never blamed them for yellow fever. Uh, yes, anyway. Okay, so one of the points that becomes clear to anyone that's ever looked at it is all the paintings and the statue are exactly the same pose. They're all based on that original old photograph of a portrait that someone did probably back before the Civil War. The second photo, I think perhaps Kevin knows something, the second portrait here, we are pretty sure that the artist also commissioned a painting that he could use to sculpt, to sculpt the sculpture that's in Statuary Hall. And this, of course, Dr. Gorey wasn't there, so I believe the information is he had a model brought in who looked a lot like Dr. Gorey and had an artist paint him. And I think this is the painting. And Peggy will notice one thing. What is this on his lapel there? Oh, yeah. yeah the medical caduceus, which is in the museum. So, uh, the, the, the mu Yes, yes, and you have the microscope. Take a look at it, it's pretty much the same. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Well, and the other thing, I'm looking at this very carefully, on the original portrait, there is the micro, well, on the table, there's some kind of paper. 
there's nothing whatsoever visible on the paper. We've all assumed that was a copy of his patent or patent application. And on the copies that were done later, that's what is shown is a schematic for his air conditioning or his ice making machine, actually not air conditioning machine. So in exploring this, I think we did learn a couple of things about Dr. Gorey, but someone out there in 1910 or so had that portrait. Oh, what a marvel it would be to find out where that is. Okay, now, but as far as Dr. Gorey's life, he was a pioneer in Apalachicola. He moved here in the early 1830s and um, basically became one of the first town physicians and, uh, and was practicing, as I mentioned earlier, as port quarantine officer. I don't have to mention all the, the jobs they did. Doctors in those days were, you know, they were paid with chickens and stuff. So to make money, you had to get another job, like be postmaster or customs collector or uh, quarantine officer or something, so the federal government would pay you a salary. Well, uh, so Dr. Gorey was Apalachicola Fort physician starting in 1833. And then a, a well-known incident was that a ship called the Magellan came in in 1835 with sick crew. And Dr. Gorey went out to the ship and decided, first off, he decided it wasn't uh, uh, small, yeah, it was small. Yeah, it was small parts. Small it, yeah, it was, scarlet. okay. But he decided to avoid spreading it to town, he would stay on the ship. And he stayed out there below decks for two weeks. And I have a feeling that started to make him think about ventilation. <laughs> like, my goodness, we're sitting out on the port in Florida in the middle of summer, and my goodness. Uh, so ne needless to say, no ships had much in the way of ventilation back in those days. Okay, medical perspective back then um, was amazingly primitive. One of the things that strikes me is Thermodynamics, or the study of transfer of energy, is something that really began seriously in the 19th century. When Dr. Gorey went to medical school in the 1820s, it was a very minor topic, although he seemed to have been very interested in the, phys the physics of, of different uh, events. Back then, they called heat caloric. They thought it was a thing, and that you got cold when you didn't have enough caloric. They didn't know about vibrating molecules yet. Um, so in a lot of his writing, he talks about caloric. We're going to sort of figure out how, with natural law, we can manipulate caloric. caloric. So the laws of thermodynamics weren't really formulated until 1850s, 60s, 70s. And back then, as far as disease went, no one knew what caused yellow fever or malaria. The common thought was it was some sort of vapor that came out of the swamp. And of course, we had plenty of marshes nearby. Um, both, mal well, malaria literally means, mal means bad, and area means air, it means bad air. That was what people blamed uh, the disease on. Yellow fever was kind of the same. So they'd hang gauze curtains thinking that they, maybe they could filter out some of the volatile agents that caused the, the disease. The germ theory was sort of known, but it didn't really become proved until Pasteur and Koch later in that century. So when Dr. Gorey was down here, in really a remote outpost where the only significant medical library was the one he had in his home. Uh, science was simply not that far advanced. I, I give the man credit for a great deal of intelligence. Here's what we now know. Yellow fever is a virus that came from Africa. In fact, it was transferred probably to the Caribbean and then this country because of the slave trade. Uh, People who probably had yellow fever were put on the ship. Some of them survived. Uh, basically, the agent was brought to the New World and mosquitoes spread it from person to person. Um, there is uh, an immunization for yellow fever now, but even so, there are still thousands of people that die every year. And as a matter of fact, uh, most of you who know about Dr. Gorey know, he and his wife owned several slaves. They were, uh, they helped in the medical practice, but Carolyn was running a hotel. She had guests to serve, she had laundry to do, she had all kinds of tasks, cooking and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so basically, you know, 1830s, 40s, 50s in the South, people were slaveholders. And uh, actually, well, let's see. Um, you look on the slave record from 1850, it's kind of hard to see, but this says John Gorey, and there's a list of slaves. 
and I don't know whether he owned them or Carolyn did, having married her, basically any slaves that she had, and she did have slaves, uh, I guess sort of became his as head of the household or something, even though she was making most of the money. Um, but what really triggered Dr. Gorey to start thinking the way he did was a yellow fever epidemic of 1841, which of course is most evident if you go over to uh, Port St. Joe to the old cemetery and you see these mausoleums. I think actually there's a local historian named Dale Cox who actually took this photograph, I found out later. But these are a couple of the burial chambers of people who died on the yellow fever epidemic of 1841. It struck Apalachicola also, just not quite as severely. And at that point, Dr. Gorey started thinking, how do I help these patients? And he got the idea, which was fairly common at the time, we know yellow fever comes in the summer. We know people get sick, and then when the fall comes, if they've survived, there's a remission. There's something about being able to cool people. And of course, I suppose the other thought would be, if a person has a fever and you can cool them, maybe they'll do a little better. So that became uh, the topic that he thought about literally for the rest of his life. He never really let up on it. So here was the notice in the St. Joseph Times in 1840, the schooner Herald in distress after an absence of 10 days with Captain Cup for dead and all hands sick with fever and egg. That was a ship that brought yellow fever to Port St. Joe, and, or Old St. Joseph rather, and basically started to wipe out the town. They lost about half the population to yellow fever, and then a couple of years later, a hurricane hit it, and destroyed the structures that were left, and Old St. Joseph simply disappeared from the map and didn't really return until about 1910 when people went over there and started fishing and other items. So, of course, if Dr. Gorey is thinking about cooling, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Well, there's actually a, what may be a humorous anecdote here. Carolyn Gorey was running a hotel. She needed ice to cool the drinks, to make desserts, to you know, do th nice things for her guests. And here her husband is coming in and filching the ice. He's taken one of the rooms in his, her hotel, put an air duct in it over a, hot, over a bed and put a bucket there that he can put ice cubes in or blocks of ice and have the air come down the ceiling across the ice onto the bed. And you think, okay, so he got the idea I can cool patients if I can get my wife's ice, but of course what we know is the ice ship didn't come. So there you were in July in Apalachicola wanting ice, and the only ice in town was under a sawdust pile in Caroline Gorey's hotel, and her husband kept filching it. <laughs> I don't know strictly that's true. I'm sure he bought his own ice, but frankly, he gave up all his jobs when he became obsessed. He stopped being the postmaster, he stopped uh, being the port, uh, the marine, the marine officer. He stopped everything, and had even a very limited medical practice. She was earning the money in the family. She's the one that had the resources. So as Dr. Gorey started to think about it, he remembered reading texts in medical school. Okay, so the point here, I guess, at this at this point is, he knows he can cool patients somewhat with ice but the trouble is the ice runs out at the very moment you need it. And instead of costing 10 cents a pound, it might cost a dollar a pound. And his wife wouldn't stand for that much filching out of the, the, the penny jar. So he thinks, what else can you do? Well, he knew that if you compressed any gas and then expanded it, that the expanding gas would cool things. And one of the reasons he knew this was there's a a book called A Preliminary Discourse on the Study of Natural Philosophy that was in his library. Dr. Gorey read this thing, and basically there's a quotation, well, this one is a quotation in which he cites this book as the source of the inspiration, and he says, writing in 1842, he says, we could use room air for a refrigerant. If we compressed the room air and then expanded it, we could cool the air. So whenever or wherever the escape of air under these circumstances takes place, it will expand and in the process precisely the quantity of heat which was previously obtained from it will be absorbed from all the surrounding uh, substances and rendered latent. In other words, you're cooling the air using compressed uh, uh, room air or you could use another gas. But basically, he, he, he also knew that if you start bringing air in and use a compressor to compress it, what's gonna happen? The air will heat up for a couple of reasons. Number one, 
you haven't taken any heat out of the air as you're compressing it, so you're forcing all the heat that was there into a small space, and you're also doing mechanical work on that air with the, pr the pump that's being used to compress it. Um, so he understood that, and probably so did everyone else at the time. Um, and fortunately, in the last couple of years, some of Dr. Gorey's original writing has been digitized and can be accessed even at home on a computer. Uh, and actually, Kevin Baer is the one who pointed out a couple of these to me and, and helped send some links. Now, uh, the one to me that is most striking was published in 1842. This is just one year after the epidemic. And the problem that we have is partly Dr. Gorey never signed his articles with his own name. He used pen names or nothing at all. This one was anonymously published, but we know it's Dr. Gorey. It was called Refrigeration and Ventilation of Cities. Imagine that. He didn't just think, we could cool a little room in my wife's hotel. He says, let's cool New Orleans. Maybe that was why he didn't get a lot of takers. When he <laughs> okay, how are you going to make a dollar off of that? I don't know. So this was in the Southern Quarterly Review, the first edition, 413 to 446, April 1842. Remember, he had to write everything out longhand, send it to someone, have a type script, have it reviewed. I'm sure he wrote this at the end of 1841. This is still nine years before he got a patent for making ice. In order to ascertain the mechanical force which will be necessary to give air a certain degree of compression, let's suppose the cylinder is just so big and, and he has a schematic of a piston or a, that's gonna go through a cylinder and compress air. This is where he's starting to think about we're gonna have a force pump that compresses air as a beginning to our theory. And basically, the f almost the first calculation he made was how large of a pump or a cylinder do we need to be able to cool the room in a house? And he made an assumption about, well, suppose the house had so many occupants and they were taking in so much air. How much would you have to do? And he worked through it and he said, actually, it wouldn't be that big. Um, something like a cubic foot capacity with an airtight piston, blah, blah, blah. And he's showing the thing being compressed. And of course, when it compresses, it heats up but then he removes that heat. And here's what I'd kind of hoped would be a little joke slide, but I think it's probably real. This is, this is not Caroline Gorey, but <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so she owned the hotel, which was the Gorey residence. She purchased ice to keep her produce fresh and make cold beverages. And she was probably delighted that her husband quit his job. Uh, used to use several pounds of her ice every couple of days to cool his patients and ran a steam pump in what used to be her carriage house, which this is a carriage house, right? So the same thing was back behind Dr. Gorey's place. She must have been a, I don't know how patient she was. We, we don't hear her voice, but we have a feeling once in a while there were words exchanged. Now this is, this is something that I'm surmising. This is not the first thing that you jump to after we find out that Yes, he hung a bucket with ice over fever patients and was able to cool them a little bit in that room. He actually built what I think was the first air-conditioned fever ward in Apalachicola in 18, about 1844, certainly by 1845. And there are witnesses who say that he did. It's not just the things that he wrote. Um, and basically it was that the victims almost always got the disease in the summer. And you know, now we can take aspirin or Tylenol or something and kind of reduce the fever. Back then there was no such thing. If you got a fever, you know, you could put the people in the bathtub and try to cool them off. Um, so when he was doing that calculation about the pump, literally the first, the first calculation he made was uh, how large does it have to be to cool a house? A second thing besides the Southern Quarterly Review that's now digitized and online and easily accessible is a series of articles he wrote, apparently they were published in 1844 in Apalachicola in the paper called The Commercial Advertiser and there was a series, it was 11 articles, something like that, under the pen name of Jenner. There is nobody else in the Southeast who could have written those articles but John Gorey. So we're pretty sure it was John Gorey. And the author of that says, by the way, I, I'm sort of quoting the stuff I wrote a couple of years ago in the Southern Quarterly Review. So yeah, that's probably the same person. So here's just one example. On the prevention of malarial diseases, number 10. 
And it must be clear that if we can discharge into a room, house, or cabin, a uniform, continuous, and abundant volume of not simply fresh air, but air depurated of all deleterious matter by condensation, because you put it in a pump, we can not only furnish the most powerful means of ventilation, but must entirely remove the causes of malarial diseases, assuming that there was something in the air in the first place. A powerful machine, well planned for illustrating the purposes, has already been made, 1844. In, in that paragraph, do you see the word ice? I don't see the word ice. I see ventilation, room air, blah, 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 blah. I think he actually had made this thing. And uh, other people may disagree, but if you read what he wrote, it's almost all about this sort of thing. I think this is a picture of what he actually invented. It's called open cycle air conditioning, which basically means instead of using Freon or ammonia or R2, whatever the heck you get out of the can down in the shop, you just have an intake that brings in room air. It goes through a compressor where it gets compressed uh, so many fold in, in volume. Now this is now hot because you just compressed it. It goes through a, a duct that comes over to a cool source of air where it exchanges some of the heat and then comes over to a turbine or something that actually acts as a valve. It goes through the valve and expands and as it expands it cools. And because Dr. Gorey knew physics, he knew that if he could cool a room, he could cool anything, including salt water or something else that might not freeze or maybe something that would freeze. Then the cold air goes in the room and then gets returned. This sort of thing exists. In fact, if you've ever flown on a jet aircraft, that's how they do it. It's an open cycle air system. And the reason it's interesting is there are no poisonous gases. You don't have to risk that ammonia is gonna leak out of your tank. And I think we all know what ammonia smells like, right? That is exactly what Dr. Gorey invented based on the readings that I take. However, he then went to New Orleans, actually he traveled quite a bit. He had to go to Cincinnati to have the machine built. Although we think perhaps, Kevin and I have discussed this a little bit. Here he is living in Apalachicola. I don't think there's an iron foundry in Apalachicola, right? You can't just go down to some guy and say, here, here's a sketch for a machine made out of iron and stuff. Can you just make me this and bring it up to the house next week? No. What I think he did was go down to the docks where they repair steam engines, got a steam engine because he needed the steam engine to run the, the machine. And they have pumps, for instance, pumps that pump bilge and stuff. Anyway, pumps were a pretty familiar device. He put the thing together in the carriage house himself. This guy is smart. And he, he thought, well, so here's an actual overhead sketch from his actual patent. Um, oh, excuse me, over on this side, there is a pump that's gonna be compressing the air. Out here on this side, there's actually a flywheel. And in the museum, it's, the flywheel is just sitting there. You think, well, how come is there a flywheel? The flywheel hooked up to the steam engine. Now, Dr. Gorey, not being a boob, he thought, you know, cost you a little bit to run a steam engine, but you know what, what if you put a sail up on the roof? You just had the, the wind turning the sail. That could turn your pump. But I think maybe in Apalachicola he decided that didn't work too well. Then the compressed air comes out and goes through a sort of worm tube to lose some heat. And then it goes into this tank. So this tank basically is a big iron tank that holds compressed air. And while it's in that tank, it cools off because the iron radiates the heat out to the room. Then it comes out of here and he's got all kinds of levers hooked up so the flywheels are turning and cams are going around and gears are, you know, everything is linked to everything else. And there's a second part basically where a turbine or a valve is bringing the air out of this compressed tank and expanding it through another worm tube that in this case is going to go through a tank of salt water. That's over here. And then in the, on top of that salt water, you can put little trays with water and just let them freeze. And the way he actually did it was he'd add a little bit of water and let that freeze and add a little bit more and let that freeze. And he'd wind up with a block that, you know, he might have been able to make a pound each cycle or so. The original one was, was fairly small, but we are pretty sure that he'd done that by sometime, certainly by 1848, 
Um, and uh, one other thought there is probably the reason he contrived the ice making machine was he went to New Orleans and people said, so you can cool a house. How do you sell that? How about you made something like ice? We could sell ice. So he goes back and says, oh, all right, I got to make this thing make ice. But the principle is the same. You have a pump. There's a tank that holds the compressed air. You expand it through a valve. The expanding air cools something. It could be a room. It could be salt water. It could be something else. So uh, he actually had two scale models made that were sent to the patent office. One went to the patent office in the United States, and one went to London. And he received his first patent in 1850 for ice making and refrigeration in London. And I have not at this point seen a copy of that patent. I would love to see it. I would love to read what he wrote because I don't think he just said ice making. He said, you can cool rooms. You can, he was particularly interested in hospitals. We could cool hospital rooms and make our patients more comfortable. But the actual machine sent was one that was configured to be making ice. Um, and the source of power, I, I think it's worth uh, mentioning it again. He used a steam engine. There were only three or four choices. You could have had an animal turning a style. You could have had wind doing something. You could have had a hired person or a slave turning a, a gizmo. But what he did is he had a small steam engine that ran the thing, and it was in the carriage house. And so all the apparatus was probably not in the in the home itself. It was well, like you know, in your air conditioner, the the uh, whatever that thing is that the, the repairman has to come and fix is outside because it's, it's exchanging heat. You don't want that put into your house. You want the cool air coming in the house. So there were, there were steam engines that were in the 1.5 to 40 horsepower range that were actually designed to be stationary and work in the table. I have a feeling that he got something like this. That's another reason we would love to see some of his papers. What did he buy? Uh, what did he put together? How did he do this? We don't really know because that information has been locked. And here's, here's another item that sometimes meets with a little skepticism. This is another apocryphal story. But if you uh, read a book by a Dr. Becker, uh, which is very well researched, came out in 1972, he says that Mrs. Betsy Liverman, Dr. Gore's nurse, was caring for fever patients in 1845 when the steam engine compressing air for a cooling ventilation was allowed to run too long, she verified the story that the distributor pipes iced up. And some people would say, ah, ice, you can make ice in Florida in July, how about that? And bingo, I think Dr. Gorey already knew that. And some people say, oh, that couldn't have happened. Well, I don't know, I own an air conditioner. <laughs> I've had it ice up. <laughs> Stuff can go wrong. That's a, still a pretty common complaint. When it happened to mine, I asked the guy, what caused that? He said, ants. Ants went up there and they were eating something. And I said, you're kidding me. He says, no, it's ants. Come and look, I'll show you. Anyway, so in his lifetime, he received two patents, the one in London, improvements in machinery or apparatus for producing ice and for general refrigerating purposes. He knew, and it's very clear from his writing, you can refrigerate ships. You can refrigerate trains. You can refrigerate your home. You can cool anything. You can keep produce fresh. You could make ice. You could ship stuff around. He, it's all, you know, 1844. He was writing it in the local paper. And at that time, simply nobody was listening to him. Um, well, and then the one that he got in the U.S., um, it was this one for the ice making machine that didn't specifically mention refrigeration. But then as he was trying to get that scaled up and sold and having a very hard time finding an investor, the only one that, person who invested money took more than half of the credit and then died and uh, wasn't able to finish that one. But he had put in another patent. Uh, he said, fourth, I bequeath unto my wife all my interest in certain patents granted or to be granted for a cooling and disinfecting ventilation, the interest of which will be solely ours basically. And unfortunately, he died. And then, of course, his wife wasn't able to follow up on the patent. And after so many years, those things are put in some file or shredded or I don't know what they did in the day. I don't know if it's possible to get that, but it would be fascinating. Um, so here's sort of a, a repetition, a quick timeline. 
1841, the yellow fever epidemic focused him on thinking about cooling fever wards for patients. 1842, he did set up a system in his home to cool patients by moving room air over ice that was suspended above their beds. And oh, that's a year after. But he also published his ideas about mechanical air conditioning. And one of the comments at the end of the fever man was, after Dr. John Herschel in England, who, whom Gorey had cited, heard about Gorey's work, he said, oh, ha, 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 I told my friends about that years ago that you could set up a system that would cool everything you wanted. But he didn't publish it. Gorey published it twice. And I think probably also in the patents, but he published it in the commercial advertiser and he published it in the Southern Quarterly Review, precisely what one would need. Then he started his work on mechanical refrigeration about 1843. 1844, he published a series writing as Jenner in the commercial advertiser. 1845, according to some anecdotes at least, he had a system for cooling fever rooms using a steam engine and a compressor that was back in the carriage house. In 1846 or so, he started working on his mechanical ice machine. And I think most likely that was because the possible investors in New Orleans said, we're just not interested if there's nothing to sell. So ice he could sell, so he re-rigged the thing, uh, put in for his patent, and we, uh, we know that he went to Cincinnati to have the working model and also the, the scale models that were sent to the patent office built. Applied for the patents in Britain. Um, 1850, he did receive a patent, and that's the same year that, apoc not apocryphal, that basically he told Alvin Chapman, yes, I can make ice in my workshop. And Alvin Chapman sort of let the, the French uh, liaison in town, Monsieur Rosanne, know about it. And Rosanne was going out taking bets that we can have cooled wine on Bastille Day. And that was served at the mansion house in 1850. And people said, oh, he made ice in Florida. Well, he'd been doing this for six or eight years by then. He had no trouble making it. Now, there's also a story that he apparently made ice for some ice cream social somewhere along the way with the church. Uh, I don't think there's quite as much evidence, but people talked about that. Um, then he got the patent in England, then he got the patent in the United States, submitted a patent for ventilation and room cooling and died. And this is a case where nobody is totally sure what caused his death, but having to fight through trying to convince investors to invest in a machine. And, they, we, and actually, Kevin just sent me some information that maybe he had gone further than we think because on this last page, no, excuse me, I had a couple, couple more things to say before that. Uh, uh, one of the other tales is that possibly Dr. Gorey was on a trip to uh, New York and met a Frenchman named Curry and explained what he was doing. And a guy named Curry went home and invented a patent for air conditioning in France. I really don't think that happened personally. And the reason I don't think is we know what uh, Ferdinand Carré patented, which was an ammonia cycle, a closed cycle uh, air conditioning system. It's based on the same idea of compressing a gas until it becomes a liquid. Uh, you compress it, you run it over here, it's hot. You have to vent the heat. And then uh, basically it becomes a liquid refrigerant and comes over here and then there's a, a little valve that causes it to expand and go through a, a, another uh, set of coils that will basically cool like what's in the back of your freezer. And so this was the first modern type closed system uh, method for refrigeration, ice making, whatever. You can pretty much do anything and that was patented and was quickly followed up and uh, within a few years uh, they were, well there, there's another connection that I, I've always found fascinating which is the ice machine came back to Apalachicola through Captain Whiteside because he and his brother had both worked at the Columbus Iron Works during the Civil War as basically that was a major foundry for the Confederacy and they knew the owners. They, um, after that war, the uh, Columbus Ice Iron uh, Foundry started making ice machines. They brought in a fellow named H.D. Stratton 
who had developed an ammonia, a, a large scale ammonia cycle uh, refrigerating system. And these were industrial scale that could literally produce tons of ice per day. And I once went down to the dock here, uh, Scipio Creek, uh, Mill Pond, and asked a guy, so if you were putting ice in your boat, which anymore they've got their own refrigeration, they don't have to do that, he said, how much ice would it take? He said, eight tons. And one of the things the uh, Apalachicola Ice Company did with their machine from the Columbus Iron Works was they had a sluice over the river and the shrimp boats could come by or fishing boats, open their hold and they could just dump the ice in 300 pound blocks down into the hold. And that's really what started the fishing industry in Apalachicola because once you could preserve fish, then you could sell it, you could bring it up here, you could send it to Atlanta. And there were people in Apalachicola who did exactly that thing. And it was really Captain Whiteside that completed the circle from Dr. Gorey's initial cycle, initial thought of a conception of making ice in Apalachicola to being able to actually do that and sell it. So it's not a direct connection, but uh, I find it fascinating. Um, and basically, sort of just a summary of it, what I think he did, yes, he developed a machine for making ice, but he was also, maybe more than that, a pioneer in air conditioning and published writings about it, how to do it that would still stand up today. People, engineers have read it from heating and air conditioning uh, agencies and they've, they say, yes, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't change much in that. Unfortunately, in, he couldn't find investors that would uh, put the money behind it so the, and they knew the main commercial application was ice making. So uh, using one of his models, he did make ice at the mansion house in 1850, he did get a patent in London. And my conclusion sort of for the whole talk is, I got the impression the first time I went to the Gorey Museum, so here's a diorama with showing Dr. Gorey talking to somebody else and there's a patient in a bed and there's a bucket with ice in it and a duck coming down. And he ran out of ice, so he went and made an ice machine. I don't think that was quite the sequence. I think he said, I'm trying to cool patients. I've run out of ice, so now what do I do? Well, I will cool the air and I will release cool air into the room. And then the investor said, well, fine, but can you make ice? And so he rigged it up to make ice. And so to me, that's most likely the scenario that he followed. And one other sort of new item, Kevin found this uh, item in the Buffalo, New York Courier from 1854. That's one year before Dr. Gorey died. Apparatus for making ice, an engine manufacturing ice in the tropics has been patented by Dr. John Gorey of Apalachicola. Talks about it and says a machine is now in operation in the Chelsea Iron Works in New York, which has produced ice at the rate of two tons in 24 hours. The Tribune says theoretical calculations alone indicate the production by aid of a four horsepower engine, eight tons of ice per day. So what's interesting to me partly is apparently there was a scale that model made, at least this reporter thought so. And secondly, it says about how large a steam engine would be required to do the job. And it, you're only talking about one to four horsepower. So I'm thinking probably what he had in the shed was maybe a one horsepower table steam engine. And Kevin sent me that and you know, as a scholar you might say, well, show me more sources and that sort of thing. But I think about the time he died, he wasn't just a guy with a couple trays of ice cubes trying to interest people and in cool on their drinks. He was people, he was able to produce large scale ice. It may not have been the cheapest or most efficient. It's not the method that was followed, but he did it. He didn't just talk to a friend and say, oh yeah, I knew that all the time. He, he published it. And in science, you get credit uh, if you've published the idea and not just because you talk to your friends all about it. And I will show you one last slide, which is simply, there's some wonderful references that I could send to anyone if you're interested in. The book by Raymond Becker is a very good, well-documented source. But also we have uh, these digitized articles actually written by Dr. Gorey. And you definitely get a different idea about what he's thinking about if you read his primary work, because that's him speaking from his own voice. And I have no Norwegian jokes to end this. <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, thank you. <laughs>
questions? Yeah. Ah, uh, well, locally, he was very esteemed in Apalachicola as a grand physician. And of course, the, the popular conception is that because a fellow named Frederick Tudor had established an ice trade by basically cutting ice out of lakes in New York, putting it into ships with sawdust and shipping it as far as Calcutta and other places, that somehow Dr. Gore is saying, I'm able to do this really cheap right where you live was a problem. At any rate, there was some bad press in the North, we know that. I don't really know if it caused Dr. Gorey the heartache. He did think, I put my idea out there and people just aren't listening. So there, there was definitely a quotation that said, there's some crazy loon down in the South that claims he can make ice as well as God. Well, that's just some newspaper guy talking, but uh, people who knew the science knew what he was doing. Uh, there was no question about what he had done. Uh, the, I'm sure the patent offices in two countries were quite thorough. Um, so personally, I would not call him the father of ice making or air conditioning or something like that, but he certainly was a pioneer. One of the things that occurred to me in doing this, was there a thermostat somewhere around? No, there was no thermostat. It was probably invented around 1880s and didn't become commercialized anywhere until the 20th century. So that's why the machine would have iced up. You couldn't just turn it on and let it run. You had to turn it on until the room got cool and then walk out there and turn it off. There's no switch, it wasn't an automatic circuit. So a lot of stuff got invented later that came together to create the kind of air conditioning, refrigeration and freezing that we know about. And uh, the other item about Dr. Gorey's personality, he was number one, I see him as being a very obsessive person. I don't see how he could have done this in Apalachicola without having many sleepless nights thinking, how do I achieve this? How do I go from here to here? And having to do it himself. There was no chemical industry. He couldn't run down the street and say, could I get, you know, 500 pounds of compressed ammonia from you tomorrow so I can make a machine? No, he couldn't do that. He couldn't even go to an iron. I mentioned sleepless nights, Katie. We th I, think, I think Dr. Gorey had sleepless nights too. <laughs> As, as, as an obsessive person. <laughs> yeah. so, so basically he kept to himself. We don't even know what he said to his wife. We know a few things they said to Dr. Chapman because Dr. Chapman wrote it down and we know what he wrote for the paper. But he wasn't a guy that was out schmoozing with everybody in town. He was too busy focused on what he was doing. And the fact is probably not even Dr. Chapman knew what he was up to over there. People didn't have the sophistication. He was a very sophisticated man, uh, Dr. Gorey. His medical uh, library was wonderful and basically had physics texts. And I think he frequently went to New Orleans and New York. And I'm fairly sure, besides looking for investors, he went to consult with colleagues and went to libraries and read the latest information about how do you work with this kind of a system because he was a physician, not an engineer. Um, so I think basically, oh, I, I probably said enough. <laughs> yak, 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 so yeah. another, yeah. I like to that question. So why do you suppose he published under the name Jetta, under the studio? Was it a credibility? Was he not getting credibility and he thought he'd take a stab under another name to see how well. that was received? <laughs> I, I suppose the secret went to the grave with him, but certainly he knew about Jenner having an immunization for smallpox. And he was probably the only one in town that did, because uh, that had happened before Gory ever got involved with yellow fever. Um, and, and he, and the theory is that he, he had political issues in town. So. Yes, very likely, because after all he had, as was typical of almost anyone of any prominence, He'd served in most, of, he'd been the mayor. So, okay, I guess that's enough said, right? If you're the mayor, you, <laughs> whatever you do well for people, someone's gonna blame you. So forget it, you can't please them. So he just kind of kept quiet and agreed to publish this whole series. It was one a week for like three or four months uh, in the commercial, and every, every week he'd have a little essay about, uh, here's a, uh, uh, how do we prevent malarious, malarial fever in Apalachicola? And, 
It was, it was 1844 when it was published. And his article in the Southern Quarterly Review, which said almost the same thing, was 1842. Uh, so to me, that's, that's precocious. It's just amazing that, well, the patent for air conditioning that Willis Carrier got was 1906. So here's some guy in a little country town with like 2,000 people in it uh, that has come up with this thing on his own with no ability to communicate with a major library or you know, major city. Or, it's astonishing to me. But you also might take into account from a political perspective the, uh, the demise of the town of St. Joseph. And it was it, <laughs> a very good, yeah. competition. Yeah. Uh, and the two towns hated each other. So it might have been that he was touching on a really... Some nerves. Some, yeah, yeah. The town. Good, good point. I, I think that's true. And, and he wasn't the kind of person to put himself out there. He just, he really wanted to help his patients and uh, get the idea out. And basically, he wasn't really trying to profit. He just wanted to have it done. Um, well, I'm, I'm sure he would have been happy to make a little, but. Do we have any insight in the, into the therapies how effective? I guess it wasn't a therapy, it was more. The, the treatment. <laughs> so, so, well, I've only seen one point on that, and, it, and I, you'd have to actually find out how many patients did he have, how many survived, what was the typical survival rate back then. I've read one article that said he seemed to have better results than most physicians by having them being cooled in the fever ward and the kind of care he was giving them. But of course, there was no treatment specifically for the disease. So, um, and, and, that, and that's a very good question, is how effective was it? And the answer was, of course, until there was a vaccine and you knew the mosquitoes caused it and that you really had to drain the swamp and keep them away from the area, uh, that you're not gonna have a, and of course, we also know that mostly happened during the Spanish-American War and when they were making the Panama Canal because yellow fever was killing thousands of people. And Walter Reed was sent down and he and maybe some others figured out it was the mosquito bearing this thing. I don't think viruses were really known as like a biological entity until even later. No one had a microscope that could see a virus in the 19th century. Um, it takes an electron microscope. They said it was a thing that will cause a disease that goes through a filter and doesn't stop. But you couldn't see them. So if you looked it up, it would probably say 1920, 1930. So, so it's, it's not real surprising that she didn't know the causative agent. You didn't really have a specific treatment that would do well. And, and yellow fever causes something, it, it's hemorrhagic. It causes in excessive bleeding. It's a very gruesome death. Um, yeah, exactly, yellow jaundice, precisely. And bleeding from the mouth and lungs and all kinds of things, it's terrible. Kevin, the plague doctor, could tell us more about that. My God. <laughs> we have the expert. <laughs> well, thank, thank you all for attending and bearing with me until your bottoms are probably flat. <laughs> yeah. Kevin, I still feel like a moose with this thing.